Oh, it's the phone. Oh, it's ringing. Who's there? Could it be? Hello? McDonald's. Yeah, can I order some food for delivery, please? I don't do delivery, I'm afraid. Uh, can I have a McWenton with uh, fries? Uh, do you do any um, anything with uh, cheese on top? Who was that? What was that? It was the past. The past. Hello and welcome to In the Court of the Winter King. We're doing a new band today, aren't we? Yeah. What's that band? Quite an obscure band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no one's ever really heard of them, so... Called? Called Pink Floyd. Strange name. Yeah. So we're going to review one of their obscure albums from years ago. This, this thing, it's called Dark Side of the Moon. Um, it's a good album. Do you think it's a good album? I think it's a pretty good album. Yeah, in fact, it's a very good album. Yeah, so I'm going to give this six eggs. What do you give it? I'll give it um, six eggs. Six eggs as well. There you go. It's a six egg album. So there you go. That's our review of Dark Side of the Moon. That is our first six egg album. That's our first six egg album. There you go. So anyway, while we're here, secret word for today is pudding. So anyway, while we're here, I thought maybe we'll do a review of a kind of a bootleg, isn't it? This is, this is a strange kind of bootleg in that it's a, a recording of a radio. So obviously the sound quality is, is tremendously good by bootleg standards. Um, of the 1971 recording from the Paris Theatre on September the 30th. This is your first delve into bootleg territory, isn't it? Yeah, I don't really... Um, bootlegs have always seemed to me a bit of a quirky thing. They are really sort of... It's really sort of fanboy territory. Yeah, yeah. Really, um, really. And I just don't get... Well, I don't, I, just, I don't understand or I don't feel I'd get much out of delving into it in that kind of depth. The only thing I could see it possibly doing is, is bursting the bubble. You know the veneer of perfection of a band. If I'm, I'm really into a band that much, if I delve into bootlegs, I'll probably find something that I don't really want to find. Yeah, <coughs> Led Zeppelin. <laughs> so it's, it's you know it's it's a better it's Pandora's box. Don't open the box because it's bad. I think I mean this this one is significant, partially because of the same quality, but also because it has what I think is the best version of a song that was was wasn't properly released until a compilation in the 80s or something. So that's interesting. With the, the embryo. This was presented on John Peel's show. I don't think it's Top Gear. It's not Top Gear! What was the show? It's called John Peel Presents. John Peel Presents. Music shows. Music shows, yeah. John Peel's music show. He seems um, very polite about Pink Floyd, actually. Yeah. Which surprises me a bit. I thought by then he'd hate them, but maybe after Dark Side of the Moon he'd hate them. It's a real transitional period for the band. And what, what's really interesting is you've got the 1970 performance at the same venue. I assume recorded with the same equipment. So you hear the development from 70 to 71, and, and it is at exactly the right moment where something's changing and you hear them get together basically on this performance they are they are now together they know what they should sound like they know how to do it and, and they're relatively tight about it you know only if you li if you go right way back to like the man in the journey 1969 that's a very different story um, you've also got the live performance on omagama uh, but obviously that was selected carefully for the the best performances uh, which is great as well so at this point they 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 they're getting it together live they're starting to put things together well, you've got to you got to remember they were sort of forged in the belly of 1967, the Summer of Love. Their album was number two to uh, Sgt Pepper's. You would not expect a band that sort of found itself in that period to be making songs or albums like Dark Side of the Moon and the Wall. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a decade uh, a decade later, but here you can really hear it. You can really hear find the that, that sort of melancholy is, is creeping in. The soundscapes, because they got a very unique sound, haven't they, Pink Floyd? Mm -hmm. um, and although it was unique in 1967, it was it was unique in a sort of it was Sid Barrett unique. Yeah, it was quirky. Yeah, which is a very different thing. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas this is much more compositional. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, a lot of it is is about structure, certainly at this point anyway. But also about the songs, which is Roger Waters' thing. Strangely, Atom Hartwell that was number one in the UK. It was a big hit, obviously partially because of the sort of gimmick of it, of having an orchestra on a, on a big piece. But you could certainly argue that they weren't really they were out of their comfort zone trying to write something like that and also perform something like that. But I think that the success of that probably gave them a bit of a a bit of a boost and got them focused because. You wouldn't have. You would assume them to, to fade away slowly, you know? but then the, the fame went back up again for whatever reason. And you can hear it in the performance that they're they're much more self-assured by seventy. I actually quite like Adam Hart Mother. It's not it's obviously not my favourite, but you, you can you kind of get a sense that the difference between Adam Hart Mother and Dark Side of the Moon is is quite big. But it's an accumulation of 
of small improvements, if you know what I mean. So there's mm. lots of small improvements. And they're, they're, you can tell by the performance of one of the songs in here, they're constantly improving their sound and constantly reworking them and sort of honing them. Yeah. I think this is this is the real genius of Pink Floyd. And I think this could be where it could come on slightly under listening to bootleg. If you listen to an earlier version of a song, it could be quite it could be quite upsetting because obviously it doesn't do what you want. When by the time they get to the album and Dark Side of Moon or whatever, they've actually really, really sort of honed it and yeah and made it made it yeah. book out. Um, what what else is interesting is that you know they are they call themselves the laziest band in the world and I think that's part of the reason why it worked in a way in that they would faff around studio time making silly noises and just you know they called, recorded a track called Nothing Nothing Two Nothing Three you know and of course Return of the Sun of Nothing was was an amalgamation of all these farting around bits and pieces and it's that architecture thing which enabled them to actually construct a big piece out of that in the way that they couldn't really do with Atom Harbour. They could do with, with that kind of thing. Simpler music, but structurally just as complex. So yes. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to review Pink Floyd. Yes. So, first song. Fat Old Son. Fat Old Son. I really like Fat Old Son. I think it's the best thing on Atom Harbour. Um, and I like the way it's developed over time and turned into this jam and stuff like that. It's the only time where I think that the Gilmore song is better than the Roger Waters song. I mean, if is all right, quite like it. But there's an element of Grandchester Meadows about it, which is I find Grandchester Meadows incredibly boring. Uh, Fat Old Sun, it, when, when you know they, you can see they started going in this folky direction. It's a great song. It's one of Gilmore's best compositions. There aren't many. That's one of his best songs. That is. And I love the way that they extended it into a jam. Yeah. They extended everything into a jam, obviously. But I think it works really nicely. There's quite a few big songs in, in this set list. It's only five songs in the set list. Um, but this this is the most memorable one. This being the only the first time I've listened to it. I think it, it stands out because it is a little bit different. There's a, there's a more positive vibe to it. You could almost imagine jo a lot of George Harrison's influence on this, sort of like a an ode to the nice nice old son sort yeah. of sort of type type thing to it, and it sort of evokes old Pink Floyd to me. So it's sort of it's got one foot in sort of the '67 and, and the '60s Pink Floyd, and, and one foot in the sort of the way, the way they were going. And it sounds really sort of and a little bit a little bit different. Yeah, good different. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is he's, his voice developed. He's much more self-assured. You listen to the album version; it's very subdued. Um, whereas here, he's much more self-assured in the vocals, and it helps a lot with the song. It makes it when, when he's just you listen to the nineteen seventy version; he's, he's it's just too twee because he's so quiet. Um, and that's one of the things that makes it work. But the, the other thing, obviously, is the, is the jam in the middle. He's excellent. Very well worth a listen. Next song. One of these days, I'm going to cut you into little pieces. Interesting early version. I I would take this over the version on. I'm going to say up Pompeii then. I'm live at Pompeii. And I think it might be because the drums are lower in the mix. <laughs> but it, to me it just sounds better. It sounds more energetic. The, the one on live at Pompeii for me sounds a bit stilted. I don't know what it is about it, but it, that version never worked for me. Yeah, I think it's definitely in need of finishing off. Because it doesn't sound as good as, as the sort of like later versions that appeared in later sets. No. Actually, the best versions are with the, the Gilmore band. Because, you know, there's no, there's no vocals. There's no uh, lyrics. Yeah. So you don't need Roger Waters there, yeah. really. You just need a cool bass player. Yeah, um, but it's 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 nice to hear, nice to hear it on there. It's, all, it's always a good song, good good song live. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can't really get wrong with it, can you? Um, you didn't get the the ode to Doctor Who at this no. point, of course. Which is a bit disappointing. Yeah. I was waiting for it. Yeah, but I don't think they did that till the eighties. Next song, Embryo. The Embryo. Yeah. Now this, this is this is the worst worth the price of admission because obviously. This was a song that was was kind of never released, and it was an original version put on a compilation. I believe it, that original version w was just a demo, and they didn't intend it for release. And it ended up on some sampler or something uh, sent to radio stations, and they were really annoyed about them. And I think that's why they didn't actually put it on an album at the end. Like you were saying about Fat Old Son, I mean, I like Embryo because it's kind of 60s Pink Floyd and 70s Pink Floyd. It, it straddles the two very well. I suppose it's maybe a little bit too much like um, Set the Controls. Maybe that's the problem in in vibe. I mean, yeah. musically, it's not the same. It's not kind of like the sequel to it in a way. It's a, it's an interesting it's interesting on there in the sense that it's a bit of a peculiarity. It's not one of their big a bit like as you say, Fat Old Son. It's not one of their big songs from their catalog. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't expect to go you know to a concert. Say, let's say they form now. You wouldn't expect Fat Old Son or the Embryo to be on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're good. Really they are, but it's strange. Whereas usually when you do it with Pink Floyd, just just a year previous or certainly a year before that, the, the forgotten songs are um, aren't 
good. Yeah. Really. I mean, obviously fans are going to like them, but they're, they're not great songs, whereas this stuff is, is great. So it's, it's odd that Embryo, which was written in 68 or 69, yeah. I think, maybe 69, was actually never ended up on an album. Um, the original version is, is just the folky strumming song. I think Gilmore sings it. Obviously, it's, it's written by Roger Waters. But obviously, you hear how it's developed over time. The 1970 version, the middle section's a little bit boring. Not a lot happens. They've got some sounds of uh, of children playing and laughing. I think the idea was at the concert they'd have that going around the quadraphonic sound. People would be like, "Where's that coming from?" Yeah, uh, which I think when they weren't using that, Roger Waters replaced it with his his Scottish shouting several species of small furry animals. Uh, but that's not here at this point. I think it was a much more. Um, it's like they took it much more seriously on this one. So this is kind of the definitive version, um, and it's good all the way through. It's about twelve minutes. Yeah. Very um, very long. Which is interesting, also because. They played that right next to the next song, which is a preview of their, their new song. In 1970 yeah. they did a preview of their new song, where they needed an orchestra to play it, controversially. But this preview of the new song, of course, is Echoes. It's it's fully formed here, isn't it? Yeah. And I think it's it's considered a very good version of it. Um, I like it because you can tell it wasn't completely set in stone, and I was really surprised to hear Rick Wright playing with the melodies a bit and improvising it, which makes it really nice. Is it as good as the Pompeii version? Don't know. I'd say it's better than the 74 version, 74, 75 version, which are also interesting. The, the bits I like are the, there's the first guitar bit, so the bit before the verse, then you've got the, the funky guitar bit, um, when he, he's really going with the mummy bar and it's all... All that stuff. And also it's the very, very end, which is just a very quiet chime between the keyboard and, and guitar. Those are the bits I listen out for in a, in a live performance of, of Echoes. They're the interesting bits, they're always different and, and they are good here. I mean, the, the Live at Pompeii version is, is probably more recognisable as sort of like Echoes, the Echoes that you you know, you know listen to from the album, Yeah. whereas this is, is a little bit different, therefore it's probably slightly more interesting. But the Live at Pompeii version is probably a slightly better performance. Like that is probably actually the recording equipment. It could, yeah, it's and, the, and the vibe of the, 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 the video as well yeah. and all that, and the sound. But I mean, it is an absolutely awesome song. It's yeah. sort of, it is one of their best songs. Yeah, it's just good to be on there. It is. I mean, you say, really. in a way, it's, it's a definitive Pink Floyd piece of music. I mean, later on we are going to talk about Dogs in a couple of weeks. Often, Dogs is my favourite Pink Floyd track, but Echoes is kind of definitive, and it's a band track. They all they all wrote this song. It's a four-way meaningful thing, and you know Roger Waters wrote the song. But the song is only a bit of it, obviously. You know, and, and Rick Wright came in with those chords and with, with that little progression, and obviously the ping. Um, you know, and Dave Gilmore, the the guitar stuff, the funky bit he wrote that, and Nick Mason is on it as well. I always find the subject on Echoes quite because it's basically a bit of a love song with some weirdness, something climbs towards the sun, kind of weirdness. Which isn't very Roger Watersy, introspective kind of I think it is. tormented soul type. I think type it is. Stuff. With the, with a, apart from if, which is kind of an introduction to that stuff, strangers passing in the street, chance to, by, to yeah, whatever, that stuff. That comes from his his situation at the time when Barrett had left, and he was living in London, and he was very it was a very sort of lonely, so many people, and yet no communication and that that's kind of his whole thing isn't it that's that's you know yeah i suppose well, it's just... also about being underwater and, <laughs> as well, so. and, and stuff and stuff great song mm -hmm. i mean you consider yeah i mean you just got to consider it's 1971 it's it's four years since 67 and bike <laughs> lucifer salmon yeah. Arnold Lane and stuff like that. Yeah. What what a transformation. It's yeah. Unbelievable. It's, it's, it's very strange, isn't it? It's so it would never. It's just chance meeting of chance people in a very very unlikely situation leads to the best some of the best music ever. Literally. Yeah. Blues song is it? Blues. Yeah. Blues. It's just a blues jam. The strange thing for them to do is an encore. I can. Im I, I mean, obviously, the particularly Roger Waters wasn't too happy about playing some of those earlier songs. So maybe it's it's an answer to that rather than having to play on a lane or something. It's just a blues jam, and you you really hear how sloppy their playing is. I mean, we're talking about them being the laziest band in the world, where they just can't be bothered and they just do little bits and fart around and make silly noises. And it's sort of you can hear it in their performance. And it suits the music so well in, of, of echoes and things like that. And here you can hear it. And it's strange that, you know, the sort of master of understatement, Dave Gilmore, he's really heavy handed here, bending the notes and bow, 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 bow. I don't know, I think it's supposed to be just fun. Maybe that's the idea. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I mean, Dave Gilmore, who's like a blues guitarist, yeah. obviously doing something, obviously doing something that he likes, but probably a little bit different. And it's probably just his release, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Let's go and have some fun and have a bit of fun at the end. But I mean, yeah, it's all right, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's a blues jam, isn't it? Yeah. I and mean, you can't really go wrong with it. I mean, there's no cavalry with that axe. Very, 
weird because it was so good by this point. So what did you think of the album, uh, the, the performance as a whole then, Kev? Um, I think it's great. It's amazing how they've, they've just got it together. In the space of that year, they've got it together. I don't know if it's because they had a number one album and it sort of inspired them and made it a bit more real that they could really could achieve. But they've also been writing better stuff, so it was worth performing it well. That's really interesting. It's great. It's, it's worth getting for Embryo because it's the definitive version of Embryo. And obviously the sound is, is fantastic for a bootleg. What did you think of it? I enjoy. I actually enjoyed listening to it. I was a little bit sceptical to start with because I was a bit worried about sound quality and and being disappointed. Horrified at how yeah. rubbish they were. Undermining my uh, musical heroes. Actually, it's kind of augmented it in a, in, in a curious way. Because um, some of the songs are in development, and I know where they, uh, you know where it ended up. It kind of gives you that, that sense of how much they are actually honing the songs, and how much they're improving them over the years, or, or over the, the performances. I think someone in there is a real perfectionist. Now, I would, I would assume it's Roger Waters, but I, I actually get the sense that it's more than just Roger Waters. I think they all had quite high standards, although they're yeah, lazy. At this point, it, it is a band. It is, yeah. it is four people. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think they have incredibly high standards, and I think that's what drove them to produce some of the music they did, because they're not fantastic musicians. Compared to the, the contemporaries. The contemporaries. I mean, yeah. you think, you know, Led Zeppelin and some of the, the, the proggy stuff going around at that time. You got Yeah, at this point, they would have been compared to King Crimson and yeah. Yes, and that kind of stuff. And, and sort was, of having a year off to, to, to practice. Yeah. They, couldn't, they couldn't do that. Was, they had to find something else. And they did. And big they, time. They did it by writing really, really good songs. And yeah. really, really working on them and making them... How should we do it? I know, let's write really good songs. <laughs> the best music in the world. Yeah. Let's do that. There's a certain elegance to it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite simple, yet it's, it's just awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's goodness without complexity. Yeah. So, egging is difficult, obviously. Um, with a bootleg, but obviously the, these are two a different standard. These are different eggs. Okay, the, these are bootleg eggs. Bootleg eggs. Yeah, bootleg eggs. Um, and obviously, sound quality comes into it. Original, um, unavailable song comes into it. Performance comes into it. So this one has to have five eggs because it scores very highly on all those those traits for me. So five eggs for that. That's 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 a high standard. It's a high egg. It's a high egg count. We start bootleg run on a high egg count. What's important in a bootleg for me? Sound quality, yeah. Yeah, it's got it's got to be five eggs, Kev. Yeah, because it's, it's got everything, isn't it? Yeah, what can it's you perfect. Do? Like, well, there you have it. Yep. Thank you very much. Join us next week for a bootleg we haven't decided yet. So surprise. <laughs> See you next week. Bye bye. Give us some likes.